Now, ladies and gentlemen, the next session will be lead and moderated by our very own moderator, Mr. Aan Suryana. Now, give a pause to Mr. Aan. Hi, Mr. Aan, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Okay, now I would like to introduce your profile for a bit so the audience can get to know you just a bit better. So, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Aan Suryana here is a lecturer in political science at the Faculty of Social Sciences, Universitas Islam International Indonesia. And Mr. Aan is also a managing director, uh, sorry, managing editor in Muslim Politics Review. And it is a peer-reviewed international journal published by Universitas Islam International Indonesia. And Mr. Aan here is also a visiting fellow at ICS Yusof Ishak Institute, Singapore. Correct, Mr. Okay. Before we begin the session, I would like to once again remind the audience that there will be a Q&A session if the time allow us at the end of the panel. And please everyone raise your hand and then state your name and your affiliation. Keep your questions straight and short. And also, one of the speakers right here will be joining us online uh, because she is currently residing in the United States. Um, who are the speakers? It will be introduced by Mr. Aan after this. Um, okay, Mr. Aan, are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Ready. Okay, everyone, give a round of applause once again to Mr. Aan, and the floor is yours. Yeah, actually, a round of applause should go to our speakers here. So I was asked by uh, Dean of Faculty of Social Sciences, uh, Philip Vermonte, to review 26 abstracts submitted uh, for this conference, and I'm pleased to see in the booklet that uh, 16 uh, are going to uh, be presented in uh, this uh, very big uh, event, uh, jointly conducted by CSIS and Google. And also probably uh, FOSS, uh, Faculty of Social Sciences, also contributed to this event as well. And we, be, we will be having four speakers uh, in this, in this uh, panel. Uh, the first one is uh, Nurianti Jali from Oklahoma State University, who will be uh, speaking through Zoom. Yuko Kasuya from Keio University. So please come to stage. Yeah, please. Uh, Andi Ilmi Utami Irwan from University of Palangkaraya. And uh, my colleague, uh, Afi Madonna. So every presenter will be having 15 minutes to uh, share your research and then it will be followed with question and answer sessions. Uh, without further ado, uh, floor is yours for KU. Okay. okay, according to the program is okay. Uh, Norianti Jali first uh, from Oklahoma State University. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, let me share my screen. Uh, hold on, let me share my screen. Okay. Hi everybody, I, uh, I apologize that I cannot be here because I was supposed to be here, but I was stuck in the space because of uh, our bad weather. Uh, my name is uh, Noreen Hijani. I am from Oklahoma State University, Assistant Professor uh, of Faculty Communications, and I am also uh, a visiting fellow at I I ICM University of uh, Singapore. So today I'm going to share with you uh, my research in 2022, looking at uh, Malaysian election. Uh, and uh, at a time, I was interested in looking at TikTok because TikTok was uh, the it platform for the young ones in Malaysia. So um, this is basically the today's, uh, today's agenda. I'm going to introduce you uh, the social media landscape in Malaysia, and then we're going to take a look a little bit about hate speech and disinformation and propaganda tactics in Malaysia, and then TikTok as a new frontier in G15 in Malaysia research and findings. I know the previous uh, previous panel. Uh, Uh, close to 
27 and in 2023, and then we have uh, close to 80% uh, uh, active social media users, and our number one platform uh, uh, still Facebook because a lot of old people like me on Facebook, and then we also have uh, you know a rising app uh, TikTok at a time TikTok uh, uh, came close a second to uh, 90 million users, and then we have Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. And time spent using internet in Malaysia, close to eight uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, Nuri Anti Jali, uh, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think that your yeah. presentation goes missing. Missing? Yep, uh, we, have, uh, no, we have not been, okay, yeah, goes back online. Thank you. Okay, okay. You, you can yeah. continue. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was on my site, I didn't know what happened. Uh, so, uh, let's just get back to the time spent on, on the internet in Malaysia. Uh, the time spent on internet hours and then social media is close to three hours so this is basically the overview of uh, social media landscape in Malaysia and I want to also introduce the key terms used in this research uh, there's like a, a lot of uh, these three words that I use in my paper if you go on the, uh, the website so one is propaganda propaganda by definition uh, for this research is deliberate expressions uh, of opinion or actions to influence uh, other people through manipulations and psychological manipulations. And the second term is hate speech. Hate speech in this research uh, is defined as any communication that discriminates, disparages uh, a person, group on basis of characteristics, this race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, nationality, religion, and protected category. And then uh, finally, uh, of course, the key term that we want to focus on today is disinformation. Uh, intended creation and dissemination of false or deceptive, uh, deceptive uh, information. So here, uh, I, I want to uh, give you, you know, uh, maybe not all of you are familiar with Malaysian uh, politics and Malaysian election, but in Malaysia, we also have like a pretty much a similar issue with Indonesia, but a little bit different, right? So I'm just going to introduce this to you. There are three broad categories of election law practices in Malaysia. Number one is manipulation of voting acts. Uh, where we also we often have issues of only hantu, not already passed away, so they get lines to vote because uh, there's one, you know, allegation of uh, using uh, people's uh, ID of people who passed away to go and vote, miscounted, misreported votes, and then the second one is manipulation of voting choice. This is what I'm going to focus on today because we have an like, issue with the election community. Uh, okay. So manipulation of institution, we have electoral commission, the nation first pass, uh, first pass the post system, and we also have a uh, very language issue where, uh, you know, studies have found that uh, during the election period, uh, people in power manipulate election companies. Okay. So that's why I want to, uh, this, this uh, research is exploratory in nature. Uh, and, uh, Okay, uh, I can myself. <laughs> uh, so this research is an uh, exploratory major, and I wanted to focus on TikTok, and then like I told you, because it was the first time that Malaysia uh, passed uh, a bill allowing uh, 18 year old to vote in the uh, uh, Malaysian election. And it also, like, uh, because it was at the peak of uh, TikTok popularity, because um, Malaysia, uh, you know, uh, downloaded uh, the app, you know, uh, after a period of COVID 19, and a lot of people using it uh, to share uh, information. So I was interested in looking at whether or not it can be used as a platform for political communication. And during the election uh, in 2022, uh, we expected over 5 million new voters. You have to understand that Malaysian population is only 33 uh, million. And then uh, it was a uh, post election, uh, election, we found out that. Uh, percent out of the eligible voters came to vote. And uh, in Malaysia, these are the drivers of political disinformation. Number one, we have state actors. Uh, state actors, we're talking about people people in power, we're talking about like government agencies, we're talking about like paid cyber troopers, uh, and also lawyers. This has been found in multiple studies, including by uh, the Hopkins, uh, his uh, from Monash Malaysia, uh, myself and my co-author, uh, my, my collaborator, Ethan Ingrid, and then James Gomez, an Asian center. 
And then another uh, driver is, of course, social media and technology, right, that allows uh, people uh, to share things without uh, any gatekeeping. So this uh, happens globally. And thirdly, we also have uh, another driver of political disinformation. There's PR firms, we have public farming companies, we have political bodies, affiliated uh, media, uh, and hotliners. And another, uh, uh, another three of those drivers of political disinformation in Malaysia is we also have issues with high distrust towards uh, state media because uh, uh, the citizens and the people feel that uh, main media in Malaysia are still uh, controlled by people in power. So the narrative on uh, the mainstream media are still owned and controlled by, by uh, the government and they decide not to pay attention to that unless they are secure of the government. So they go elsewhere to find information. And another driver, of course, we have issues of media information literacy. So uh, people in the city center, they are more uh, literate in terms of how to use internal media, but not so much for people that live uh, outside of, uh, in a rural, a bunch of rural uh, areas. And then, of course, uh, Malaysia is what you talk here uh, with uh, what we call it identity politics. So another driver of political misinformation in, in Malaysia is deep-rooted political division uh, amplified by religious differences. And uh, in Malaysia, political misinformation is not new. Like, uh, I believe also like in Indonesia and many other parts of the world, it's just that we have new technology, right? Uh, previously, political misinformation being shared on uh, radio, TV, and now we have social media. And it becomes much more sophisticated along with the advancement of communication technology, and it will be, it will continue to be used by political actors to influence public opinion and political behaviors. So in Malaysia, the practice of political disinformation includes sexual scandals, uh, people accusing political leaders to engage in sexual uh, activities, uh, same sex, uh, uh, sex uh, scandal, or with, uh, you know, uh, opposite sex. We also have religious issues, the issue of corruption and hate speech. And in Malaysia, we also uh, try, the government tried to control this information to the use of fake news law, such as the news law 2018 and an emergency ordinance, uh, essential powers uh, 2021, to control uh, fake information, but it, it has been found to be uh, what we call it, uh, used by people in power to silence critics. So this is basically the research questions that I have. This is explored over to the nature. We want to go there and see what's happening on TikTok. Whether or not this information that hate speech uh, specifically prevalent on TikTok through DE, what will be uh, the primary disinformation hate speech narrative uh, prevalent during TikTok, on TikTok through GE, and how did TikTok offer a platform for this information and hate speech in Malaysia during GE 15, GE uh, General Election 15, 2022. So this is the re uh, research method. So we went in, uh, I was helped with, uh, with uh, I was helped by my research assistants. So it was a little bit over uh, one month because we just want to explore. And uh, we started collecting data from November 1st until December 15th. And Malaysian election was on November 19th. And we used Red24 uh, to kind of like look at trending hashtags, uh, look at like, you know, relevant keywords that we can use to kind of like manually uh, well, download data from uh, TikTok. So there's a list of hashtags that we use related to uh, what we call the general election 15. So it includes uh, acronyms of general election in English in Malaysia, PRU, we have already won 15. And then we also have GE 15, general election, and many others as you can see here. And uh, we have like multiple levels to this. And uh, we decided to go with uh, looking at propaganda, uh, uh, propaganda first. And then uh, after that, we try to identify this information and, uh, and hate speech. And finally, to make sense of what we found, we decided to go and interview uh, six Malaysian political content creators. So uh, when we tried to find out whether or not the content on TikTok uh, of the 
propaganda or not propaganda. So we develop a propaganda code book uh, based on uh, uh, the Institute for Propaganda Analysis and also a list of propaganda uh, that, that uh, from a previous study, from our previous study. But I was specifically uh, interested in black propaganda because black propaganda uh, is a you know, deliberate uh, sharing of false information and misleading information to kind of like influence uh, political behaviors during the election. And to identify this information, uh, it's a little bit hard at the time because we, we cannot say something this information without proving it's, it, it, it was this information, so we kind of like cross that with uh, what we call it fact check information from independent uh, Malaysian non state uh, fact checking groups such as from Manhau, MIT Malaysia, and Jokchek Malaysia. Uh, so, this is basically the framework of the research. We try to identify the hashtags and then we scrap the information using the identify hashtag and keywords and then we try to identify the propaganda. And uh, after all this, uh, or, uh, after all this uh, stages, uh, we ended up with uh, 300. Uh, hold on. We uh, ended up with 373 black propaganda and hateful uh, narrative. And then within that 373 black propaganda, which is like a inten intentional, uh, what we call deliberate false information shared, including that 989 clear disinformation, while others is uh, more of like hate speech. Uh, and there are two key narratives that we found uh, uh, in the content that we analyzed, uh, you know, in our, uh, in our religious issues and also corruption. And uh, while we observed that at the time, we also noticed that uh, there, was, there was like a, a, a trending uh, new hashtag during the election period. Uh, it's called 13 May and 13 May 1969. So what exactly is 13 May and 13 May uh, 1969 in Malaysia? And also about Samalayu, uh, it was, it, it refers to uh, the bloodiest uh, racial clash in Malaysia that happened in 1969 between the Malays and the, uh, and, uh, the Chinese community. So at that time, there was a, a, a huge, uh, what we call it, racial kind of like narrative on TikTok at that time between the Malay, uh, Malay young Malay supporters versus uh, the non-Malay supporters. But the, the Malay uh, supporters were more dominant. So they were like called for, uh, well, we call it for the Malays and Muslim Malays not to vote for uh, non-Muslim, non-Malay uh, politicians. Otherwise, they're going to go down to the street and they're going to start a 13 May uh, 2.0. They want to do like uh, the second round of racial clash in Malaysia. So that was uh, in progress. So that was like very, uh, uh, very concerning for the government. So the government was like uh, at a time they kind of like observed it uh, for a bit and then ended up calling TikTok to see the ministry to kind of like have TikTok explain uh, to them why are such content kind of like flooded on TikTok. So here's what, what we found, uh, uh, you know, all the different propaganda techniques that we found on TikTok. Uh, one, of course, uh, one of the, the, the most popular technique that we found was character assassination. A lot of time, uh, TikTok users calling uh, candidates uh, names, uh, calling them kafir, so for example, is uh, Kafir is a, a how how do you say it in, 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 in English? But you may uh, you understand what I mean. So Kafir is like for non-Muslim uh, leaders, uh, and uh, they also uh, call other people Kafir if they if they found out that uh, Malay uh, celebrities supporting uh, what we call it non. Mostly non I'm sorry, uh, uh, Nuryanti, you have got five more minutes. Okay, yeah. Right. Okay, so this is an example of the TikTok uh, screenshots that, uh, that, that, that we found. This one is so that you can see example of uh, name calling, example of propaganda that we found. And then the second one, uh, uh, to answer the second research question, to the primary that this information in his speech narrative, uh, this is like what I said. Uh, when it comes to ethno-religious narrative, one of the examples, right, 
But we also found uh, another second uh, dominant narrative, which is on corruption. So a lot of time, uh, people recycle old issues. Because in Malaysia, one of the famous issues was one MDB involving money corruption. And then uh, that issue, despite the fact that Jibraza, the previous prime minister, was not contested, but the issue was also still being played uh, on TikTok. So there's two uh, different narratives. Uh, that, that we found on TikTok, but predominantly was on ethno religious because uh, at the time, uh, 15 May and the Bangsa Melayu was trending on TikTok. And because of that, we also wanted to go and uh, have conversation uh, with, with uh, Malay uh, Malaysian political content, uh, you know, uh, on TikTok, content creator on TikTok, trying to understand how exactly that TikTok allowed make have open doors for that to happen. So they said it's pretty easy, uh, including uh, use of like spellings that are not detectable. Uh, you do not have to spell it you know, correctly. You have to be creative with your spelling if you want to write uh, in the caption. Or you can easily speak in your local dialect, right? So that can easily bypass and using the live section. So uh, one of the, one of the uh, interview we uh, said this, many divisive uh, content in Malaysia and Chinese streaming on TikTok, even uh, after one week of the election, because uh, this person said that TikTok didn't do much about them. So that's why the Malaysian ministry at the time called TikTok to go and meet with them to explain what happened uh, on the platform. So the conclusion is pretty simple, right? Uh, uh, what we call it, there's a lot of uh, uh, issue uh, with TikTok at the time, uh, in the Malaysian election, they feel that TikTok did not respond as, as fast in removing the content. And at the time, there also the calls that uh, content creators uh, could use uh, to kind of like create emotive content on TikTok. And as a communication technology evolved, we were pretty, uh, we're like, uh, you know, a little bit concerned about what kind of content that can be created and put across platform. Uh, including TikTok. So I just wanted to give you an example here of AI uh, as I'm working on crime crime. We're singing uh, on TikTok and many other uh, political leaders, you know, major political leaders singing uh, AI voice uh, on TikTok. And strategies uh, to, to secure uh, election, I would say we have to be more, uh, uh, there's more effort to kind of have uh, local experts to help oversee staff on the platform and have political actors and tech companies accountable uh, when it comes to uh, overseeing this information on the platform. And of course, increase funding and institutional support uh, for independent fact-checking bodies. I hope my, uh, my presentation was clear. If you have any question later on, just let me know. Uh, thank you. Uh, let us give a round of applause to Nuri Andi Jali. Uh, thank you for your uh, concise and coherent uh, presentations. And now we are going to have a second uh, presenter, uh, Yuko Kasuya. And I now remember that I reviewed uh, her article. I think this is written with other two colleagues, right? Your uh, article. Other three colleagues. Right? Other three colleagues, yeah. yeah on uh, disinformation uh, in the Philippines. Right. Uh, floor is yours, 15 minutes. Recording you. stopped. Ah, great, thank you. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me for this wonderful, wonderful, well-organized conference. I really appreciate the CSIS staff for uh, all the arrangements and also the chair who picked my paper, I mean, our paper. So, uh, after Malaysia, we are moving on to the Philippines, and uh, this is a paper I have been working on with my three colleagues, and uh, uh, my name is Yuko Kasia. Uh, I'm a professor at University in Tokyo teaching political science. Before going into our paper, let me briefly introduce myself. I'm Japanese, but still I'm, I study about Southeast Asia, uh, including uh, Indonesia. And uh, recently I have been interested in issues such as uh, democratic backsliding, 
political polarization and disinformation. I'm sharing the interest with most of you here in the audience. And another thing I would like to note before I proceed is about this uh, research project funded by the Japanese government. Um, the title of the project is uh, Disinformation and Democracy in East and Southeast Asia. We have this acronym IDEA project. Uh, the project period just started uh, last year, 2023 July. It will go on to 2029 March. So we have been studying elections in Taiwan. I just came back from Taipei and uh, observing Taiwanese election and uh, with regards to disinformation. And uh, we are also studying, this project is also studying Indonesia's 2024 election. Uh, we have 15 collaborators in this project, including computer scientists, data scientists, economists, so forth. And we also have an Indonesian collaborator, uh, Dr. Uh, Shelly Harriet, uh, who is also a SAIL member. And a uh, picture on your right hand side is our project website, which was very short lived. We launched this in December last year, and within one week time, we received cyber attack. So probably, you know, this indicate that the nature of our project is attractive to some people who do not want us to study disinformation. Now, let me move on to the uh, content of our paper, research paper. So as everyone knows, President Ferdinand Marcos Jr., or usually known as Bombo Marcos or BBM, I will be just referring him as BBM uh, in, throughout my presentation. So BBM won, right? Some people might say, why is this something puzzling to study about? I would say that you have one of the presidential candidates for 2024 Indonesian election, Prabowo. BBM and Prabowo have lots of things in common, or so many political contexts are very similar. And uh, I kind of believe that, that that was one of the reasons why uh, our chair uh, picked up our paper. So, uh, BBM, as everyone knows, is the son of former dictator in the Philippines. So his father ruled the country, and uh, President Marcos Sr. is known for being corrupt, known for collapsing Philippine economy, and human rights violations. So we wanted to study why BBM, as son of a dictator, became so popular to win a landslide election. There has been lots of explanations why BBM became so popular. And uh, what we are focusing in this paper is the role of disinformation during the uh, 2022 May election. And we are particularly focusing on disinformation about Marcos Sr., his father, the dictator. So in this paper, we have two research questions. One is, to what extent did voters believe disinformation about Marcos Sr.? I will talk more uh, in concrete sense what kind of disinformation was so prevalent. Secondly, we wanted to know whether disinformation helped boost support for BBM, right? So just to give you a short answer before I go into the details of our analysis, according to our nationally representative survey result, about 25 to 40% voters believed, not only being exposed, but they believed actual concrete disinformation about Marcos Senior and the the second question, well, our answer was, unfortunately, we, our research design could not disentangle whether there was a 
causal relationship between disinformation and um, support for BBM. So, well, I, I would like to talk about the dis implication of these results um, probably at, at the end of, of my, my talk. Hopefully, I hope I have enough time to talk about it. So, uh, just to give you a background about the Philippine uh, disinformation context, Philippines is known as the social media capital of the world. Indonesia may be very, uh, how can I say, well, prevalent in terms of use of social media, but Filipinos win, I, 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 I believe, according to the statistics. And this is a figure I prepared using the VDEM database, which include international comparison of the extent of domestic partisan uh, disinformation. And this is expert coded. So uh, according to the experts, this is how uh, Philippines fare and also Indonesia looks like. The higher the value, more disinformation. US uh, from 2010 to 2025, it's going up. Okay, US is very famous for fake news. However, well, Indonesia is very famous for fake news. However, Philippines is more, right? So this is the context that we are talking about. And another uh, brief note about the disinformation business. This is the Philippine version of how boozers work. Politicians hire peer strategists they pay for influencers, paid disseminators disseminate disinformation, and volunteer disseminators would propagate. Uh, so we have the term called troll, which is the equivalent of boozers uh, in Indonesia. Another important background context I would like to talk about is the length of the disinformation operation or, or information operation in general regarding the, the Marcoses. So Marcos Sr. himself provided this information, not digital, um, uh, but uh, so he himself wrote a, a book filled with fake news about himself. And Marcoses were kicked out from the country in 1986, but they were allowed to come back in 1991. Since then, they have been operating to rebrand re the Marcos name, including the hiring of uh, this Cambridge Analytica uh, consultants. So uh, we are moving towards 2022. This is the Da fake news database prepared by uh, check.ph. I believe this is equivalent of check factor in Indonesia. The right hand side figure shows the number of fake news they figured out. Uh, Lenny Robred, opposition candidate, received the highest number. Second, a BBM, the candidate himself, and Ferdinand Marcos uh, was the third most. Uh, talked about figure in the disinformation content. And breaking down the nature of types of disinformation, the most uh, talked about disinformation about uh, Marcos Senior was about economy. The second one was about human rights. And third one was about so-called Marcos gold story, that Marcos had so much gold and so rich. So, well, uh, the backgrounds are over. Now let me talk about our research design. So uh, we conducted two studies in order to address research two research questions I, I proposed. Study one is to study the extent of disinformation exposure and belief and association between disinformation and BBM support. For this, we uh, commissioned a nationally representative face-to-face -face survey uh, to study this. We also ran online survey at the same time. This, this took place uh, 
two weeks before the election in 2022. Study two studies direction of causality. So uh, we will find, we found, there is a strong association between the belief in Marcos Senior related disinformation and support for BBM. But we do not know which way the causal arrow goes. People may be believing in disinformation because they support BBM or they support, uh, I mean, or, or they received BBM, uh, I'm sorry, they <laughs> received the disinformation, therefore they support BB, BBM. So we wanted to know the, the direction, right? Study one, uh, we have three types of uh, vignettes. One is about the economy, S saying typical story goes like this. So Marcos Senior's era in the Philippines was the golden age of the Philippines in terms of economic development, right? And we asked res respondents whether they are, know this, this news or whether they believe it. And uh, this is a second vignette. The human rights related fake news goes like this. The, the guy on your, uh, in, in the picture, right hand side, former defense secretary during Marcos senior period, he said that there was no human rights violation during Marcos era in the interview, in the, in the, in the discussion with BBM. So this is the second type of fake news we asked. The third type of disinformation is, is about Marcos gold. There are several variations, like Marcos had um, gold from the Japanese soldiers during World War II. Or, there are lots of uh, variations, but uh, we asked, uh, so this is one of the typical things that Marcos had so much gold in his possession and they lent it to more than 100 countries in the world in the 1940s. Oops, since I'm well constrained uh, with time, let me go quickly go to the results. So this is the overview of disinformation exposure and belief. The blue bar is the degree of exposure. Yellow is degree of belief. This right hand side, uh, from your side, left hand side panel is face to face survey. Right hand side panel is online survey results. So basically what this figure tells us is that, uh, well, this is more nationally representative accurate result, but uh, well, so this one said, this one shows that about 25 to 40% of voters believe in this, this disinformation about Marcos Senior. And online, sub, online respondents uh, have higher degree. And uh, so ec economy story, gold, golden era of Philippine development is most believed. This one breaks down between BBM supporters and non-BBM supporters. The red bar is the BBM supporters. So just to give you a quick uh, summary, the BBA supporters believe in, uh, I'm sorry, BBM supporters are more exposed and they believe uh, in, the fake, uh, in the fake news more than non-BBM supporters. So we have a very strong correlation between belief in disinformation and support for BBM. This leads me to, oops, uh, well, uh, this is a regression results basically showing the same thing. And let me go to study two because my time is running out. So basically we, we found a strong correlation between the support for BBM and belief in disinformation. The second study is a online survey experiment. We tried to figure out by uh, running this um, experiment to figure out which way the causal arrow goes. 
we randomly assigned respondents in three groups. Control group, no binet. Treatment group, disinformation binet. And uh, treatment, two, uh, treatment group two received disinformation plus fact check binet. Uh, well, let me, I'm sorry, I might be running out of time, but yeah, two more minutes. Okay, so we asked respondents uh, first, do you read uh, the feeling toward BBM, the BNET, and then we asked a bunch of questions uh, about the support for BBM and also belief in disinformation. Uh, probably I would skip discussing the hypothesis due to lack of time. Please go to our paper if you are interested. And uh, let me skip this. Let me skip these. These are the uh, research design. So this is the disinformation binet, and this is the treatment to group disinformation and fact check binet. So we inserted after fake news, we inserted fact check information or debunking information. So the stories we used are the same as the. The study one, uh, we used economy story, human rights story, and Marcos Gold story. Right, so this is the uh, main results for study two. Basically, uh, what we found in this study was that uh, receiving praises about Marcos Senior, the, the lies about Marcos Senior, actually decreased, not increased support for BBM. So this was opposite of what we expected, uh, but uh, that was what uh, the data says. Uh, also, the support for BBM declined. Uh, if you compare con the panel A's control group this, and disinformation group and fact check group. The disinformation groups and fact check groups support for, uh, I'm sorry, well, feeling towards Marcos Senior and uh, both intention for BBM, panel A and C declines, right? So this, is, this was opposite of what we expected. However, I would like to point out one of the important uh, findings in our study is that uh, people may not change the vote intention or which candidate to support, yet people's uh, misperception can be corrected by fact check information. That is what is shown in panel D. Right. So, um, since I'm running out of time, uh, this is just a breakdown of our main uh, result for non-BBM supporters and BBM supporters. Basically, our results were driven by BBM supporters. Right. So, uh, these are the summaries, but maybe let me go to the discussion and, uh, well, findings. Just to wrap up, what we found was that uh, in 2022 election, almost, well, half of Philippine voters, depending on the nature of disinformation, they were exposed and uh, quite a few of them believed in those disinformation. And I would say that uh, rebranding of Marcos family over the decades probably culminated in this result. So it's not that disinformation is not just a one week thing. It's, it takes years, decades to take effect. Another uh, well, finding, well, so for question number two, we wanted to know whether this information boost, boosted support for BBM. We could not really disentangle this relationship. And uh, one implication, again, is that in the case of the Philippines, 
years of disinformation operation or information operation created an entrenched, you know, uh, bidirectional relationship between disperception, misperception by dis disinformation and BBM support. Or it could be just because our research design was bad. So, uh, probably uh, I would like to, maybe, maybe we'll have some time to discuss some of the points I raised here, but uh, I wanted to highlight one of the, uh, okay, well, two, let me hi highlight two issues. One is about the changing uh, nature of democratic backsliding and also changing nature of disinformation operation or information operation. Probably you are observing something similar in the case of Indonesia. But uh, during time of President Duterte, democratic backsliding was very harsh, ostensive, direct. So as disinformation uh, during Duterte period. During the Marcus Jr. BBM presidency, the disinformation is softer, uh, indirect, more narrative-based, hard to debunk, and they also use multiple channels, well, included, including big uh, budget movies like what you see in, in these uh, posters. So uh, multiple multifaceted uh, as the theme of this conference, multifaceted way to uh, provide this information. Let me conclude with uh, just one more thing. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a bit over time. But uh, about the future avenue to study disinformation. In this project, we studied positive disinformation. So praising uh, Marcos Senior. We didn't study negative type of disinformation, and it seems to me, with regards to election-related disinformation, studying negative disinformation will be probably very important. I'm saying this uh, because actually I interviewed several people in Taipei last week with regards to disinformation, and one of the very insightful remarks I, I learned was that for disinformation opera operators, it's not about who, you know, changing the, the support to other camp, other candidate. It's more about turnout. They want to reduce turnout of their, you know, opposite camp, or boost the turnout. So, uh, in that mindset of disinformation operators. Negative disinformation just around the time of political campaign probably is the most effective thing, and probably this is what uh, scholars should be paying more attention. Right, so this concludes my, my presentation, and thank you so much for your attention. Okay, thank you. Let us give a round of applause to Yuko. And after we listen to uh, discussions on this information in the Philippines and uh, in uh, Malaysia, we have two more presenters to discuss this information in Indonesia. So we have got uh, first uh, Andy Ilmi, uh, floor is yours, and then we'll be followed by Pak Avri Maduna. So remember, uh, 15 minutes. Yeah. Check. Okay, uh, thank you, Pak Aan. Uh, and a good morning. Oh, sorry, afternoon uh, audience. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I am Andi Ilmi Utami Irwan. Uh, currently, I am uh, working in Palangkaraya University as the lecturer. And it's honor to be share, uh, to be here to share my paper and my perspective uh, about how the empathy as the strategies in uh, election disinformation. Uh, I have to disclaimer first, I'm not fluent in speaking in English, so I want to ask the permission of Pak Aan as the moderator if I mix Bahasa and English when I presenting my paper. Is it okay? 
I think it, it, this was it, this supposed to be fine, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, I want to share my perspective about how we see the election disinformation about the fake news, uh, this uh, hoax in social media. I want to offer another perspective to see the empathy strategies, how the uh, the producer of Uh, fake news use our feels about anger about uh, our kind to spreading this fake news or this information so uh, this is uh, my paper talking about it okay as we know uh, fake news has a significant influence in public opinions and fake news is almost about the social topics about the social issues and Uh, especially in political and social context. Uh, fake news tends to spread faster and more widely than uh, the true news. Uh, people uh, see the fake news as the bombastic news, so they want to share, research first, and this, and this is make the disinformation spread widely. And as we see, it is the survey from Reuters, and uh, for topics that Uh, the misleading information in uh, three, sorry, for country, United States, United Kingdom, Slovakia, and Japan, four topics is the most uh, false news that people see in uh, social media or another uh, media. It's about the most is politics and then COVID-19 and climate change and war in Ukraine. And today, maybe we see about the election against and war in Gaza. Okay. And as we see, uh, maybe uh, all of us are uh, familiar about the propaganda, uh, the false news, but uh, it's not the new, the new, uh, new happens in our election. As we see in history, uh, the the government use the propaganda to make gain uh, the power. So they spread the uh, false news propaganda, but not by the social media, but by the power of uh, word of mouth, and then it's spreading to society. And the rise of social media make the misinformation uh, spreading widely. So uh, we have uh, contacted with the uh, misinformation. And this is another survey that uh, it's impact why, why the misinformation impacts so widely because the rise of social media. And it's a how we uh, take the news Jadi bagaimana kita mengambil berita itu dari media sosial, bukan lagi dari sumber-sumber uh, dari mainstream media. Kita lihat bahwa di Finlandia, Norwegia, Denmark, dan Swedia yang kita tahu pendidikannya lebih bagus, lebih tinggi, dia mengambil berita itu dari langsung dari website. Tetapi hal berbeda, different dengan negara seperti Thailand, Filipina, uh, Chile, Peru, Dia, mereka mengambil beritanya most dari sosial media, same as Indonesia, maybe. Uh, I'm not found any uh, research about it. And this is how the uh, the growth of social media. And we uh, gain the news from Facebook and then Facebook Messenger, Twitter, and almost two years the phenomena of TikTok. Uh, when I asking my uh, students or uh, another young young people, uh, when I asking, were you uh, uh, were you if you want to uh, search information, uh, what platform you use? And almost them say TikTok and YouTube, no Google, uh, apalagi website dan lain sebagainya. Jadi. Uh, seperti apa yang disampaikan dengan uh, mba, uh, pemateri yang pertama tadi, bahwa TikTok menjadi fenomena yang sangat tinggi. Dan kemudian dari uh, Mrs. Yukot juga mengatakan bahwa bagaimana fenomena TikTok ini digunakan dalam 
pemilu uh, presiden di Filipina. Dan sama seperti dengan pemilu juga di negara lainnya seperti di Indonesia. Oke, okay. ini dari uh, Daily Social dan juga Mavindo yang mengatakan bahwa hoax information in Indonesia is most commonly found on Facebook. Uh, dan walaupun sekarang mulai bergeser agak turun, kemudian dibarengi dengan media-media sosial lainnya. Dan ini sebanding dan sejalan dengan jumlah pengguna media sosial di Indonesia. Di tahun 2019 ini dipredik uh, sorry uh, ini adalah uh, survei dari Statista yang melihat bagaimana pertumbuhan penggunaan sosial media di Indonesia di tahun 2019 sekitar lebih dari 61 orang menggunakan media sosial. Jadi media sosial menjadi arena yang sangat uh, strategis untuk menyebarkan informasi dan termasuk misinformation. Dan uh, seperti yang dikatakan oleh uh, Mbak Yunita Wahid bahwa tidak ada angka yang pasti seberapa banyak informasi, misinformation yang uh, spread di masyarakat. Tetapi ini sekitar uh, beberapa topik yang menjadi the most topic yang uh, beritanya salah di masyarakat. Dan seperti biasa berita politik mendapatkan tempat atau spread uh, misinformation paling besar. Dan... Uh, fake news and social media campaigns railing, almost railing on this information dan it's more uh, ber, uh, so it's more be, uh, berbahaya karena ini akan undermine our public trust ini akan menurunkan public trust dari penyelenggara pemilu bawaslu dan juga lembaga-lembaga lainnya bahkan public trust juga turun terhadap pemilu itu sendiri dan pertanyaan dari paper saya, apakah ini uh, penyebaran berita bohong itu apakah the lack of our critical thinking ataukah ada pandangan lain atau ada pertimbangan lain kenapa penyebaran berita bohong menjadi lebih besar. Kemudian perspektif yang ingin saya tawarkan adalah apakah empati bekerja dalam penyebaran berita bohong itu. Jadi bukan hanya karena kita kurang critical thinking tetapi kita mempunyai Uh, sikap empati dan ini dimanfaatkan oleh orang-orang yang menyebarkan berita bohong tersebut dan bagaimana menggunakan strategi ini di dalam pemilu presiden di tahun 2019 kemarin dan uh, bagaimana sosial media ini menjadi katalis untuk menyebarkan berita bohong ini dengan menggunakan atau menyentuh rasa marah kita rasa simpati kita untuk uh, masyarakat menyebarkan berita bohong tersebut Studi kasus saya mengambil dari satu halaman Facebook yang digunakan pada pemilu 2019 dari akun seward.com di Facebook. Seward.com adalah satu fenomena, satu kanal berita yang muncul di sekitar tahun 2016 ketika pemilihan gubernur tahun 2017. Mereka uh, menyebarkan berita dan sangat populer dan visitorsnya bahkan hampir sorry, me melebihi Tempo.com dan juga Kompas.com. Tetapi almost 100, almost seluruh berita mereka dari media sosial Facebook. Oke, okay. dan penelitian saya melihat bagaimana mereka, postingan mereka dalam menyebarkan informasi, baik di informasi atau informasi yang true atau berita yang fakta. Saya mengambil postingan mereka dari 1 Maret 2019 sampai 18 April 2019. Ada sekitar 178 postingan yang mereka buat. Dan saya menyusunnya dalam beberapa topik. Hanya 8 topik yang membicarakan the program of Joko Widodo dan juga Maruf Amin. Ada 10 postingan yang uh, memperlihatkan kampanye aktivitas kampanye dari Joko Widodo dan Ma'ruf Amin. Dan 110 postingan yang menyerang attacking the uh, another uh, pair uh, Prabowo dan Sandiaga Uno. Dan 32 postingan lainnya memuji uh, dan berita positif tentang Joko Widodo dan Ma'ruf Amin. Uh, As you know, oke, okay, uh, it is uh, fake news dan uh, it is uh, 
how the evolution uh, as well as the social media uh, you make the disinformation spread widely uh, and then it will be impact on society uh, tactics to exploit emotions like fear, anger, and happiness and echo chamber effect when we talking about issue A so the issue A will coming in our feeds it's like in Twitter or Facebook uh, and then it will be treat to democracy because influence on public opinions and political po uh, polarization and undermines public trust and influence political opinions okay, sorry Andy, five more minutes, yeah. five more minutes. okay uh, this is AC uh, the posting uh, the post of uh, seward.com uh, memuji Jokowi dan juga menyerang Prabowo. Dari postingan-postingan uh, tersebut, serangan terhadap Prabowo, 110 postingan itu mendapatkan interaksi sekitar 194.541 dengan jumlah reshare sebanyak 38.478. Pujian kepada Joko Widodo yang walaupun berbeda 68% postingan terhadap Prabowo sementara postingan terhadap memuji Jokowi hanya 18% tetapi memiliki interaksi yang hampir sama. Interaksinya sama. Dan bagaimana mereka menggunakan postingan-postingan mereka untuk mendapatkan research dan juga uh, comments like dan sebagainya satu foto dari uh, satu foto ataupun postingan dari Jokowi biasanya memperlihatkan bahwa Jokowi adalah pemimpin yang baik dibutuhkan oleh Indonesia orangnya soleh sangat muslim kemudian personal attacks terhadap Prabowo menyentuh agama identitas lainnya dan juga berita hoax dan almost 100% berita tentang atau postingan tentang Prabowo itu adalah misinformation. Jadi mereka menggunakan itu, menggunakan kemarahan audiens kepada Prabowo untuk berita tersebut disebarkan dengan sangat uh, sangat menyebar dengan luas. Kemudian mereka menggunakan persona yang baik dari Joko Widodo, persona yang soleh, uh, dekat dengan muslim terhadap Joko Widodo. Dan hanya delapan postingan yang memperlihatkan program kerja Joko Widodo. Ketika kita abai terhadap misinformation, akhirnya kita akan uh, lebih banyak melihat uh, background ataupun postingan-postingan uh, terkait uh, kandidat tentang hal menyangkut personal mereka. Karena yang ingin diperlihatkan atau ingin menyentuh adalah uh, emosi kita, kemudian kemarahan kita, dan kemudian rasa kasihan kita. Tidak lagi berbicara terhadap program-program. Oke, okay, ini tadi seperti yang saya sampaikan bahwa ketika program hanya berbicara 5%, dari hasil uh, penelitian saya, saya melihat bahwa hampir seluruh 178 postingan dari sword.com ini menggunakan uh, atau memancing rasa emosional kita untuk bisa men-share apa yang mereka posting. Dan ini ditarik kepada bagaimana fake news itu bisa menyebar dengan uh, sangat luas dengan menggunakan atau mix our feelings to uh, to touch our soul or feelings so we want to reshare to community our friends or our family and what I see the BS uh, in the uh, hoax news or fake news atau disinformation ini kita cenderung mencari informasi atau para audiens ketika saya memperhatikan sekitar 150 ribu interaksi tidak ada diskusi yang e, dinamis ketika person yang sama mengomentari Prabowo pada saat 178 postingan itu dia memposting sekitar 30 sampai 50 dia akan hanya membenci terus sementara orang yang memuji Jokowi di postingan yang sama dia akan memuji diskusinya hanya defense dan kemudian menyerang satu sama lain. Tidak ada pertumbuhan interaksi, diskusi yang lebih baik di halaman komentar mereka. Jadi, uh, misinformation membuat, semakin membuat bahwa kita cenderung tidak ada 
tak ada pertumbuhan diskusi yang lebih baik di bidang politik, tetapi kita hanya menguatkan pandangan kita karena diperkuat oleh berita yang ingin kita lihat. Kemudian yang ketiga bahwa misinformation ini membuat polarisasi semakin tajam, semakin luas. Karena ketika informasi disebarkan secara bombastis, emosi kita tersentuh, akhirnya kita akan cenderung membela mereka dan kemudian menyerang uh, other candidates yang kita tidak dukung. Oke, okay, bagaimana dengan the future of Indonesian elections? Satu dinamika menarik untuk kita lihat bahwa bagaimana mainstream media yang seharusnya menjadi pegangan kita untuk Uh, memberikan berita-berita yang uh, sesungguhnya, yang real, tetapi pada nyatanya kemudian mereka mengikuti bagaimana media sosial berkembang. Clickbait, jadi media so media mainstream ini menggunakan berita dengan judul bombastis supaya kita klik. Dan biasanya ini pengalaman uh, empirik saja bahwa berita bombastis ini pada akhirnya berbeda judul yang bombastis beda dengan isi beritanya dan tidak kemungkinan bahkan ada satu dua kejadian mainstream media bahkan menyebarkan berita yang salah karena ingin mendapatkan uh, share reshare yang tinggi dan itu kembali pada nilai ekonominya dan harapannya bahwa Kompetisi antara media mainstream dan media sosial ini sebenarnya tidak terjadi. Media mainstream bisa kembali kepada ruhnya untuk menyebarkan berita yang sesungguhnya, berita yang benar. Dan bagaimana pendidikan politik untuk hal-hal uh, yang menyangkut empati ini bisa kita tekan lagi dengan banyak melatih uh, mereka untuk melihat secara gagasannya dan lain sebagainya. Dan Uh, apa yang kita takutkan bahwa uh, ketika hoax semakin menyerang, kita tidak lagi melihat pasangan ataupun kandidat tetapi dari uh, gagasannya ataupun program-programnya, tetapi yang kita ingin selalu lihat bagaimana kita relate dengan kandidat situ dari latar belakang identitinya, mulai dari agama, kemudian kesukuan, dan uh, hal personal lainnya. Itu dari saya, terima kasih. Uh, let us give a round of applause ya. Yeah. Uh, and now we've got uh, last presenter, uh, Pak Afri Madonna. Uh, he is a lecturer at uh, FOSS and also executive director of Populi Center. Uh, for is yours, uh, as usual, 15 minutes. All right, uh, good afternoon, um, everyone here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity given to me for presenting uh, this uh, quite uh, old and uh, in progress uh, research, actually. Um, so um, this research might not directly relate to uh, the big topics that we are discussing today about uh, disinformations and misinformations. Um, but it is indirectly related to that because, um, you know, uh, polarization, as um, some of the authors, you know, previously captured nicely, um, you know, uh, partly, dis partly caused by, by uh, misinformations um, you know, spread out uh, to, to uh, voters. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the, uh, the, the dimensions of uh, polarizations based on... Um, um, you know, survey experiments that, that we have uh, done um, in Jakarta um, in uh, a few years ago. All right. So um, when we talk about, uh, you know, uh, Indonesian politics, uh, most scholars, especially, you know, um, um, you know in, the, uh, in the last uh, few, uh, few years, um, often, uh, you know, characterize Indonesian politics as, as being polarized. Uh, but the problem is that um, we do not, uh, you know, measure, you know, uh, clearly what, what polarizations uh, that we mean. Um, so far, when we talk about, uh, you know, polarization in Indonesian politics, we are talking about um, sort of like, uh, you know, cleavages uh, based on, you know, based on, um, you know, uh, two political camps, Right, uh, you know that, that we can uh, trace back um, to uh, Jakarta's election in 2017, 
and um, Indonesian uh, elections in 2014 and uh, 2019. But the question is that what is political polarization and how do we appropriately measure this uh, political polarization in Indonesian context and to what extent that political polarizations, you know, um, occur uh, based on uh, our uh, measure. So, um, in general, um, uh, I think uh, previous research by, by Mas, Mas Okta yeah, um, has um, um, told nicely about uh, political polarizations. Um, surely this, this is a topic uh, that uh, is worth studying, I think, because it, it, it affects the functioning of our democracy. Uh, yes, we know that positively, you know, it increases uh, political participation, um, simplifies political choices, and uh, strengthens uh, political party uh, and consolidates, uh, you know, uh, political groupings. But it negatively, it leads to political gridlock, you know, uh, debates in, in, in parliaments or, or in, in DPR, for example, right? Um, sometimes, you know, uh, based on, uh, based on, you know, uh, political, uh, political uh, partisan lines to some extent. Uh, justifies undemocratic action by one group to or another, especially uh, you know doing, especially you know um, occur you know at, at the mass level, and then uh, also um, it also uh, extends uh, political conflicts. Um, so um, in in literature of uh, American politics, for example, we know that you know uh, political uh, polarization you know has you know um, has uh, extend has extended. You know, to, to many issues. Previously, um, you know, uh, people tend to be bipartisan in, in seeing, uh, you know, some uh, foreign policy issues, for example. But now uh, they they they, uh, they they have been different, you know, at seeing these these issues. And in general, you know, Carthens uh, and Donahue, I think, uh, for, you know, uh, a book published by Berkeley Institutions, I'll see that global trends in, in political polarization. So this is not a unique case in, in, in established democracies, but it's also occur in, in uh, developing democracies as well. So, so how, so far, we, we measure uh, polarization, um, manifests of polarization, who polarizes uh, over what? Um, elites polarization, mass polarization. To, uh, to uh, you know, most scholars, you know, uh, categorize uh, this and, and um, elite polarization, um, you know, to, to a significant extent, you know, um, is has been greater than mass polarization, and, and in many cases, you know, it drives, uh, you know, mass polarization. Over what? Um, they polarize over ideological um, issues, political attitudes, uh, policy options, uh, policy positions as well. They are also, you know, uh, uh, polarized, you know, uh, based on partisan line, sure, uh, partisan animosity, uh, you know, uh, one, uh, you know, members of, of one party, for example, you know, do not like so much, uh, you know, uh, the others of, you know, different aisle, and then effective polarizations, uh, dislike, distrust, uh, you know, uh, do not want to interact with, with those of another camps. In general, when we are talking about ideological polarization, this is what um, you know we commonly imagine when we are talking about political, uh, you know, uh, ideological polarization. So, um, um, assumes that uh, you know you can you can uh, you you are able to position yourself along a line, uh, you know, uh, along along uh, a continuum, liberal and conservative, and then you position um, themselves, you know, based on you know based on um, you know uh, some 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 uh, you know. Uh, parties, for example, or, or leaders, or, or whatever it is. And, and then um, uh, we measure uh, differences in their policy attitudes. Um, the strength of this measure is that uh, it is more precise, comparable across time, and we can track the degree of uh, polarization. But the weaknesses are that uh, it may not be applicable to, to, to uh, you know, most of voters. Uh, only sophisticated voters, uh, those who can uh, understand, you know, uh, policy issues and, and can position themselves um, on, 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 on uh, the issues. And then um, more relevant to all established democracies uh, with clear policy cleavages. Uh, you know, uh, the U.S. Um, is one of, you know, the most noted study uh, about this. Um, indications is that on the APRA panel, you know, we see, you know, it is not, uh, you know, uh, it is a polarized, uh, you know, position, but but lower panel, it is unpolarized one. Um, we have uh, studied this uh, based on, uh, you know, our survey that we have done um, in, in, in Jakarta, uh, 2019. 
and then um, we try to ask um, you know some some uh, you know uh, questions about some policy issues and then we try to measure political attitudes you know using several questions for example you know uh, to what extent do you agree or disagree with this statement the country will be most pro uh, more prosperous if the rule if the rule of law is based on Islamic teachings, for example, this is you know um, uh, one of you know uh, the questions that try to you know uh, capture uh, their uh, Islamic uh, political attitude, for example, you know, and then um, we have several questions uh, for this, and then we run exploratory uh, factor analysis, and then generate multidimensional nature of political attitudes. And then uh, we got um, three latent uh, variables here, political secularism, political uh, liberalism, and economic liberalism. And then um, this is uh, the questions that we use you know, to, to tap uh, all of these latent uh, you know, measures. So if we try to uh, you know, look at the distribution uh, of you know, these political attitudes, you know, uh, across uh, two opposing camps. At the time, um, the two opposing camps is uh, Jokowi, uh, you know, uh, Jokowi and, and Ahok at the time, because our, you know, our respondents, you know, we, we, did, we, we did survey on, on Jakarta voters. So um, at the time, you know, Prabowo, you know, aligned with, with Anis Baswedan, and then uh, uh, Jokowi aligned with uh, Ahok. So uh, we see two camps. And then we try to, uh, you know, uh, describe the distributions of their political attitudes, you know, based on these two camps. And we see that in most of, uh, you know, most of, uh, in three dimensions, they overlap, actually. So we see that, you know, uh, particularly there is no uh, significant difference, uh, you know, um, in general, in general. But, but we see to some extent, you know, we see to some extent that, you know, um, uh, the distributions uh, to some extent a little bit, a um, little bit uh, differ, you know, in terms of the mode. Uh, you will see that, uh, you know, in, in especially in, uh, you know, uh, Islamic politics, in political Islam, and if we, you know, run regressions and then uh, try to see, uh, you know, the ideological opposition, uh, we see um, here um, in general. So uh, Ahok Jokowi voters, you know, um, in terms of political secularism, you know. They are tend to be uh, they, they tend to be uh, on the right side, uh, much more um, you know secular you know um, in, in their uh, you know uh, attitudes on these issues, and then while uh, Anis Prabowo voters you know tend to be uh, more conservative in, in, in terms of you know uh, political secularism I uh, issues, um, but on other issues they are tend to be overlapping. Uh, you know, um, and um, on economic liberalisms, to some extent, they, they, they quite, quite differ as well, uh, partly because at the time, you know, uh, economic issues is, is, you know, one of, you know, uh, prevalent, you know, um, issues, uh, you know, um, surely economic issues, you know, uh, you know uh, are always taught during the campaign, right? And then at the time, you know, uh, Prabowo, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, Jokowi, you know, um, try to, 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 you know, to uh, put forward, you know, the narrations, um, you know, that are quite different uh, from one uh, another. Okay, this is multivariate testing. Uh, we see that, you know, there is a difference in them. All right, but ideological po polarization is quite problematic because not many voters are aware uh, of these issues and then define clearly their ideological positions and then um, they cannot sort them, uh, themselves based on these positions. Um, they understand, uh, you know, and because, you know, understanding uh, policy issues is not, uh, this is a typo, it's not an easy task for most voters. Only sophisticated voters, you know, can understand um, these this policy issues. Uh, also, um, in Indonesian context, especially most parties and voters are pragmatic. They are pragmatic, you know, rather than ideological. You know, uh, most of uh, the policy debates you know, are not framed ideologically, but but um, they are, you know, uh, framed, you know, um, under uh, you know a populist uh, narrative. So no clear signal uh, to voters. And and a last one, uh, it is possible the polarization is effective rather than uh, ideological. So um, so we see that you know it is more likely, uh, you know. 
uh, polarization is a little bit more effective, uh, you know, uh, in the sense that um, it is uh, based on, you know, uh, the figure that they voted before and how their emotional, you know, uh, emotional feelings they attach to the leaders they, they voted before and then uh, based on that, that they, they, they uh, position themselves on, on issues that, that we are asked them. So it is much more relevant to, to societies where parties are not ideological. You know, uh, polarization start when marginalized groups, you know, uh, call us, you know, and mobilize themselves to achieve, uh, achieve a political objective. Five more minutes, but All right. All right. So this is uh, three criteria to evaluate uh, the degree of, uh, you know, polarization. Uh, first, whether it fuses elites and masses uh, in large opposing camps, each of which contain elites and mass bound by strong affection. Second one, whether the country is structured into binary visions that dominates political life. And the last one, whether polarization lasts beyond the specific polarizing if and so on. Okay, um, so I tried to test the first criteria using, using survey experiments. So the question is, do leaders polarize voters based on uh, policy issues? And the expectation is that political polarization occurs when issue positioning is based on the leaders making the policy. And when one support policy belonging, belonging to uh, her leader um, uh, and rejects uh, the policy made by leaders of different side of the aisle, that indicates that uh, political polarization so occurs. So we expect that when voters know on the policy proposing leaders, they are more likely to support the policies of uh, the leaders they previously voted. So I use data from a random sample of 600 adults drawn from Jakarta populations conducted in, in, in 2019. And then uh, we weight the data based on the proportions of, of uh, the characteristics of the populations. Um, this is in general um, the, 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 uh, uh, the, 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 you know, um, the similarity between samples uh, and, and the population uh, characteristics uh, after weighting uh, the data. And then um, this is, uh, we, so we randomize our, uh, our uh, you know, uh, respondent into, into random and treatment groups. In, in the treatment groups, uh, we um, give them with, with um, the names of the leaders that propose the policy. So for example, like this one. Um, a treatment group is exposed to policy questions with clear reference to the leaders uh, proposing the policy. So, for example, during Ahok's era, flood was managed by widening the river and concretizing the area along the river no, uh, called Normalisasi. During Anis Basweden's era, flood you know, has been managed by widening uh, the river and planting trees uh, along with uh, you know, a river called naturalisasi. These two programs, however, can entail fictions of you know, people around the river, but naturalisasi uh, during Anis era requires more lands so that it risks more eviction if implemented. According to your opinion, which program is more appropriate for Jakarta nowadays? A, normalisasi during Ahok's era, B, naturalisasi during uh, Anis Basweden's era. So that's a treatment. But on the control group, we are uh, just gives, uh, you know, respondents with, with uh, the differences, uh, you know, in, in the policies without um, saying or rather referencing to, um, to uh, the governors proposing uh, the policy. And then uh, we asked them about, uh, about eight uh, policies for that. So, um, you know, a standard in, in, in uh, experimental, uh, you know, um, studies, we need to check covariate balance um, to, to make sure that there is no, um, you, know, uh, you know, some variable that might bias, you know, our, our uh, you know, our uh, result. So uh, we see that, you know, we have a quite, you know, balance, uh, you know, in, in characteristic between control and uh, treatment groups. Oops. Um, All right, sorry. Oh. Okay, um, this is uh, in general. Um, uh, hopefully, you can you can see, even though at least a little bit, you know. Um, oh sure. Okay. Um, so um, you can see that you know. Um, see, for example, uh, the first issues about about uh, you know uh, flood management, for example. If you see in the control group, for example, no control group, you know, you see that you know, um, for example, in AHOCs, uh, you know, among uh, among AHOC's uh, voters, for example, you know, uh, in the control groups, you know, and in the treatment groups, uh, the respondents, you know, um, have a little bit, you know, similar positions. So uh, they supported, you know, uh, AHOC's uh, position. So it means that even though they do not know um, who, uh, you know, uh, the leaders who proposed the policy, uh, they choose, you know, uh, uh, exactly the same. 
uh, policies, uh, you know, as uh, as as uh, the one in the treatment group when they know the the the, the, the uh, you know uh, the policy uh, uh, the the. The, the governors proposing the policy. Um, interestingly, among honest voters, and that if you see in the control group, when we do not say we, we do not reference reference the policy position to Anis Baswedan's uh, name, um, most of our voters, you know, uh, tend to tend to support our opposition, right? But but when they uh, hear the names Anis Baswedan, they uh, tend to support honest positions. And this occurs to um, several policy issues that we are asking um, here. Uh, you see that, you know, uh, you, know uh, you see some, some you know, refers, refers, you know, uh, bar chart here uh, um, among honest voters. All right, um, so if we, you know, compare the policy position uh, control and treatment group, uh, you know, uh, most of, uh, you know, most of uh, honest voters, you know, um, tend to tend to support, you know, uh, the policies when they hear or know uh, that honest persuadance, you know, um, is the governor who proposed uh, the policies. That's, um, you know, the key ideas here. So, um, but... Me, we might wonder, you know, me might wonder, you know, um, sometimes, you know, under what condition, you know, does this, you know, this result, you know, uh, bias uh, based on, you know, several, several uh, variables, for example, you know, um, it might be based on, you know, it might be bias based on partisanship, emotional attachment, political knowledge, or religiosity. So we try to, uh, to, to uh, do what we call heterogeneous treatment effect. You know, I'm simply, you know, interacting this with these several variables. And then in general, we see that, you know, in, in some, uh, you know, in most of the policies, you see that, you know, uh, most of these uh, variables, you know, amplify the effect of, uh, you know, name identification on the policy position. All right. So let me uh, go to uh, the, 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 the discussion and conclusions. So what we can understand from this study is that when voters know the policy proposing leaders, they tend to sort themselves uh, with the policy of the voted leaders. However, when they didn't know the policy owner, they tend to evaluate policy rationally. Uh, yet this is especially evident in honest voters. So leader seems to be an important signal, signal to, to uh, policy attitude. So knowing the policy owner activates effective polarization. So that is supporting uh, the policy uh, position based on the likes and dislikes of the policy owner. And some of the factors like partisanship, emotional attachment to the leaders and religiosity amplify the relationship between them, identification and policy support. Uh, but a political knowledge seems to undermine the relationship. So those who know the policy well or experience the policy implementation might not be affected by uh, leadership identifications of uh, the policy. So I think uh, that's all uh, the result of my research. So thank you, Pa. Uh, thank you. Let's give a round of applause to Pa Afri. And thank you for uh, participants uh, for still uh, going with, uh, with us. Uh, we are having, we already spent one hour and uh, 25 minutes and we have got five minutes left for our uh, question and answer sessions and we are, invite, we in, we are inviting two uh, people to direct questions to our presenters and bear in mind that we still have uh, another presenter on Zoom. Uh, any questions? Please your, raise your hand. Okay, if, okay. Uh, one, oh, and probably uh, uh, one. Yeah, uh, please uh, state your name. Yep, and your uh, affiliations here. Yeah. Uh, please, please keep your question short. Uh, my name is Shirzada. My name is Shirzada, and I'm doing a PhD in political science at UTPLA. My question is that uh, how can we manage and uh, control the uh, use of AI and the uh, misinformation, disinformation? Because we are using uh, AI everywhere, especially in the public, and now the era of the generation in Indonesia, as well as in Pakistan. So comparatively, how we can uh, use and control AI uh, not to manipulate the election process all over the world? Not only in Indonesia, but the rest of the world. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sarjeda is a PhD student at uh, UIII and a uh, former journalist with a Pakistan organization. And second questions? Uh, 
Uh, hi, uh, my name is Rizal. I'm the master's student of diplomacy in uh, Universitas Paramadina. Uh, I have two questions to the two distinguished speakers. Uh, the first question to Ms. Uh, to Ms. Yuko, you just mentioned on your presentation that you say that um, uh, the experience of how Bambang Marcos elected to be the president of the Philippines, it looks like what happened recently in Indonesia. It's quite really similar to Prabowo Subianto. So would you please picture um, uh, what is the similar uh, of the experience of Prabowo Subianto here in our election recently uh, correlate to Bambang Marcos? Because um, I did not get uh, really clear about that uh, in your presentation. And my second question is to uh, the, the, panel, the second panel speaker after Ms. Uh, Mbak Andi. Mba Andi. Uh, in your presentation, you say that um, empathy tool in um, uh, understanding the disinformation but uh, in your presentation, I did not even see uh, what exactly empathy tool is, is because as, as far as I know that empathy is something that related to human nature and how they can see the difference between disinformation, malinformation, or even a misinformation itself. Would you please uh, picturing it in a reality uh, or in a current uh, presidential elections that we are now running? in Indonesia. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, probably for the first questions, uh, Nuryanti Jalil, are you still with us? Or oh, probably is, she is gone already, yeah? So, for the first questions from uh, Sherjeda, I think, uh, oh, okay, would you like to, Pa, Sha, pa Afri and Nuryanti Jalil, would you like to address the first questions? regard to the use of uh, artificial intelligence so, so right now like uh, um, right now I'm a part of like a policy clinic for AI uh, so far for Southeast Asia we do not have like a, a law per se to, to overlook like a disinformation AI disinformation like really focus on AI disinformation because our approach in Southeast Asia is more uh, business like you know, right now, uh, if you take a look at Singapore, if you take a look like a, uh, in Indonesia, it's a more friendlier uh, approach to AI. So if you, I feel like that question is like overloaded and very generic, and this is very hard for me to answer because there's no like a clear solution for it. Because at least in the Southeast Asian uh, region right now, we're still uh, what we call it, uh, working on uh, the policy uh, for AI. But so far, the way that we approach AI is more of like a, a, a for governance in terms of like the development and infrastructure and business. Uh, in terms of looking at this information specifically, uh, the policy, we do not have it just yet. So we're looking at West right now. We're looking at the weird country, uh, Western educated, uh, uh, industrial educated uh, industry in the West to to kind of like see how they how they approach this thing. So for that questions, I do not have like specific answer. But my my point here is that Southeast Asia is more friendlier uh, business uh, approach. This information specifically, law wise, policy wise, we're not there yet. Okay, thank you. Pak Afri, would you like to address? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we, uh, how about uh, Yuko uh, for the second question, yeah? And Andy, yeah? followed by Andy. Uh, keep your uh, answer short, yeah? Right. Well, thank you so much for two questions. Well, quick comment on the AI. Well, AI can be either, well, both fr friend or for, and uh, it really depends on how we look at it. So, uh, and, uh, Alternative approach would be to inoculate people in order to counter the malicious effect of AI. So that would be one way to think about AI. The second question, excellent question. Thank you so much for raising that. So the reasons I was saying why Prabowo as a presidential candidate and BBM are parallel 
was because, well, mainly because of the human rights record of Prabowo himself and a human rights record of father of BBM. They, well, at least in the case of BBM, I'm not really familiar with the Indonesian situation, so you please educate me later on. BBM and Marco's family uh, in general very skills, skillfully whitewashed the human rights violation record of his father's era and uh, the messages they, they conveyed was, oh, we are like a Kennedy family of the Philippines and very positive, you know, uh, friendly to, to everyone. And it seems to me that's the type of message that the Prabowo is trying to convey, uh, given the like you know, cute cartoon posters and so forth. So probably you know better, but uh, so that, that, that was that was what I meant. Okay. Thank you. And last questions. Thank you for the questions. Uh, I will answer it in Bahasa Indonesia again. Uh, how the empathy? Uh, my paper is title is empathy strategies. Jadi using uh, the empathy as the strategies. Um, for uh, contoh empirik, mungkin di pemilu 2019 ketika itu ada kejadian. Uh, Belot uh, suara, kertas suara di Malaysia sana, kemudian dinarasikan oleh uh, Seaworth bahwa itu adalah hoax yang disebarkan oleh uh, pendukung Prabowo saat itu. Dan kemudian semua orang marah dan itu mendapatkan jumlah research dan likes terbanyak dari postingan mereka. Padahal kemudian pada kenyataannya memang ada kejadian seperti itu. Kemudian untuk melihat pemilu saat ini, kejadian sangat empirik, saya uh, mengambil dua kejadian yang... Uh, comes to mind now. Uh, satu yang pertama ketika setelah debat ada video yang sangat viral, video uh, Prabowo ketika saat itu potongan video Prabowo yang waktu itu dinarasikan diserang oleh Anies Baswedan. Ketika orang akhirnya merasa kasihan dengan mimik muka Prabowo di potongan video tersebut tidak ada yang sadar bahwa ketika lontaran kata-kata itu diucapkan oleh Anies Baswedan adalah mimik muka yang berbeda di saat kejadian debat itu itu yang pertama kemudian orang merasa kasihan merasa marah dan itu menggunakan empathy as the strategies dan yang kedua yang berita viral di tiktok gain ketika ada tulisan siapa yang memilih Anies akan dibunuh apa akan digebukin gitu ada kata-katanya dan kemudian diserahkan ke polisi berita itu sangat viral di kalangan pendukung Prabowo berita itu sangat viral menunjukkan kemarahan mereka dan men, men, bagaimana mereka mendukung sangat mendukung kepada kandidat yang mereka dukung kemudian di pendukung Anies Baswedan mengatakan bahwa hal itu tidak benar dan lain sebagainya bahwa kenapa pendukung Prabowo sangat keras sangat ini dan kasihan kepada Anies Baswedan dua-duanya menyebarkan berita yang sama dan kemudian Lama akhirnya terlihat bahwa itu adalah potongan video yang salah. Tidak ada tulisan tersebut bahwa siapa yang memilih Anies akan dihabisi di tempat kemudian diserahkan kepada polisi. Bagaimana orang-orang menyebarkan hoax, misinformation untuk mengundang kemarahan dan kemudian mengundang simpati untuk kita research berkali-kali. itu. Jadi hal yang paling menakutkan adalah bagaimana ketika berita-berita ini hanya untuk mengundang kemarahan kita supaya semakin disebar dan semakin tersebar dengan sangat meluas dan akhirnya kita lupa bagaimana melihat apa yang terjadi. Mungkin seperti dengan apa yang ditawarkan uh, dari panelis ketika kita bahwa ketika sama halnya dengan public policy, ketika kita sudah cenderung menyukai, kita tidak kritis lagi melihat ketika kita tidak menyukai siapa yang the owner atau the idea of the public policy, kita cenderung kritis melihat itu. Seperti itu. Terima kasih. Oke, okay. uh, thank you. Uh, uh, actually, this information is very complex issue and wide in scope, so I don't dare to conclude. I leave it to you how to conclude uh, these sessions. And let us give again a round of applause to all the presenters. Uh, and uh, our session has come to an end, and I will hand over uh, these sessions to uh, organizing committee. Yep. Thank you very much, Mas Aan, and all of the speakers for a very insightful session. Give a round of applause once again, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to request all of the speakers uh, and the moderator together in the center because we will take a quick group photos. Now, as 
our speakers and moderator are taking group photos, I would like to remind three things to the audience. First of all, if you want to access all of the papers that are being discussed today in this event, you can access it online. Just feel free to scan the barcode available in your booklet. And by scanning the barcode, you can access all of the paper online. And just in quick short, uh, the committee will also display the barcode here in the screen. So feel free to also easily scan the barcode in the screen. I would like to thank you all of the speakers and moderator and feel free to take a seat uh, because we will proceed to the lunch break. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the barcode. So uh, feel free to scan it to access all of the papers that are being discussed today. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing to remind is there is a goodie bag available to all of the audience that Fill the feedback form uh, available also digitally. So I believe that um, just a quick short, there will be another barcode available on the TV screen that the audience can access. And feel free to scan it and fill the feedback form. There is a goodie bag available for one email only. So one person, one goodie bag to everyone that filled the feedback form. And to also follow the Instagram of CSIS and safely uh, safety lab internet so the instagram is at csis indonesia and safe inet lab so fill the feedback form and follow those two instagrams and there is a goodie bag available for you but beware that this goodie bag is limited so make sure that you fill the feedback form and follow the instagrams quickly so you can grab your goodie bag and the third and last thing to remind before we have our lunch is, ladies and gentlemen, this is only the first day of the event. There will be a second day tomorrow with topics that are very much more interesting. So make sure that you attend the event tomorrow for the second and the last day. Okay, now we will proceed with our lunch break and we will gather here to begin the second session at exactly 2 p.m. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, please feel free to take your lunch available in the pre-functional area. See you at 2 p.m.